everyone, and welcome to our final panel of the day. My name is Ratna Gill, and I have the privilege of introducing this panel where we'll be discussing the commitment that's required to create sustainable anti-racist change in organization. Thank you so much to all of our attendees who have been so lively and energized in the chat. Please keep that going. We really appreciate it. And now I'll introduce Carmen Rojas. Of the, who's the president and CEO of the Marguerite Casey Foundation and the former CEO and co-founder of the Workers Lab. Welcome, Carmen. Thank we're you also, so much for having me. We're also joined by John C. Yang, who's the president and executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, and who served in the Obama administration as senior advisor for trade and strategic initiatives at the US Department of Commerce. Welcome, John. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're also lucky to have Halima Begum with us, who's the chief executive of the Runny Mead Trust, which is the United Kingdom's leading racial equity and civil rights think tank. Welcome, Halima. Good afternoon, everyone. And we are joined by Eric Ward, who is the executive director of the Western State Center and a senior fellow with the Southern Poverty Law Center and Race Forward. Um, he's also working on a forthcoming documentary about whiteness and race in America. So keep an eye out for that and welcome, Eric. And this panel will be moderated by Mary McNeil, who's a PhD candidate in the American Studies program at Harvard University. And her work is interested in space, place, and Black and Indigenous social movements. So with that, I'll pass it to Mary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ratna, and thank you, Carmen, John, Eric, and Halima for um, being with us today. I'm super excited to have this conversation with you all. Um, and we have about 45 minutes to have a conversation before we open it up to the audience for Q&A. Um, so uh, maybe I'll, I, I'll start by uh, fielding a question to someone in particular. Um, uh, why don't I start with Carmen, uh, and then folks feel free to kind of jump in wherever you, you want to, wherever the spirit moves you to. Uh, we're hoping to have a pretty organic conversation today. Um, but this first uh, the first question that I have um, is a, a question about the sort of redistribution of power and resources. Um, what are the types of uh, work that you're seeing um, that are, that are what, what is the work that you think needs to be done in terms of the redistribution of power and resources uh, to achieve, like, achieve broad goals of equity? Yeah, um, so much work. So first and foremost, thanks everybody. I'm really so excited to have this, an afternoon uh, with this amazing group of people uh, exploring these issues. Um, I think a lot of work needs to happen. We are experiencing the greatest economic inequality, the greatest racial wealth inequality, the greatest political um, participation disparities that have been uh, deeply embedded in our structural experience in the United States, right? Like these are not accidents, but they're clear features of what the making of US democracy and the US of what racialized capitalism looks like in the US. And so I think we have a long ways to go. I'll speak from sort of philanthropy's perspective. I, one of the things that I have been thinking about, I'm pretty new to this job. I feel like I have a couple more, like two or three more months of being able to say I'm a new person in this job, um, but pretty new to this job. I've been thinking a lot about the ways in which philanthropy can often confuse um, representation for actual uh, redistribution. And so there's a real desire to have more people of color on boards, more people of color in leadership positions, more people of color in the philanthropic sector, but without a, the same sort of weighted commitment to making sure that those people that we're bringing into these positions are actually aligned and committed to a racial justice agenda. And it's like the icky conversation that I think is the necessary conversation that we have to have in this moment, that there are ideologies out in the world and people ascribe to, and overwhelmingly neoliberalism has informed how we think about race and leadership in this country, as somebody who is actually more committed to a left uh, approach to political power, a left approach to economic power, what that has done, it's left us as a field with really like a say do gap. Like we talk a lot about race, but the lives of people of color aren't actually getting better. We talk a lot about race, 
but political participation or the vehicles through which people of color participate in our political system are actually being broken down or continuing to be atrophied. And so I think we, as a leader in philanthropy, um, as a sector, need to engage with this difference, like the key difference for me of like representation versus actual redistributing power and position in the sector. John, what do you think about? <laughs> yeah, sure. Let me jump in here. I, well, I, let me let everyone know. So I work at a civil rights organization. Now, our organization focuses on immigration, on voting, on uh, anti-Asian hate, discrimination, educational equity. So when I think about the redistribution of power, I also think about the systems in place, right? The policies in place that really keep our communities. And when I say our communities, I really am talking about the BIPOC community, the communities of color, keep our communities from accessing that power, right? Uh, and, and so sort of for me, it's about how do we create, how do we create those systems? You know, if you think about voting as an example, let's be clear, you know, what we're trying to do, it isn't about politics. As some people, frankly, the people on the right these days wanna say that this is all about politics and trying to get more Democrats into power. For me, that's not what it is. It's about making sure everybody has a voice. And the reality is that for too long, communities of color have not had that voice. And so when we're talking about voting, it's trying to create that system, you know, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act right now, that will allow everyone to have that voice. That's the same thing when you talk about census. You know, we had a census last year in 2020. It's a sort of, a, in some ways, it's an arcane thing that some people think of because it's in the constitution. It's like, well, what, what's the purpose of counting everyone? Well, the purpose of counting everyone is the distribution of resources. Literally about $1.6 trillion of federal resources are allocated based on census data. And so if we don't get counted right, and again, it's our communities of color, then we don't get those resources, right? So if you're talking about equitable distribution of resources, that's what's important. And what we saw in the census, and we're still trying to unravel the data, but we are pretty confident in saying that communities of color, again, were undercounted, undercounted at a significant rate. You know, the same thing applies to whether we talk about education, equity, immigration, or another one that I put in the field of civil and human rights. You know, a lot of people talk about immigration as well. You know, people should come here the right way, should come here legally. Uh, and so, so for the people that are, you know, undocumented immigrants, well, you know, they should get in line. Well, the reality is, who is it that makes the line? Who is it that decides who gets to come in? Well, it's the people in power. And historically, that has always discriminated against certain groups. You know, if you want to talk about people coming here legally, let's be honest. You know, back when and for Ellis Island in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when there were European settlers coming in, they were not coming in here in a legal manner. But it didn't matter. At that point, it didn't matter because we wanted more immigrants. So when we talk about that, it's, I think it's important to understand these systems that are in place. I agree with what you're saying, Carmen. There's these systems in place. Uh, the other thing I would talk about, and we could maybe come back to this because I don't want to hog the mic, so to speak, is just thinking about also in the corporate America, right? Where are we right now? What is the role that they have to play? Because government can't be the entire solution. You know, some corporations are starting to make efforts. Some are uneven, some are better than other, others. We need to have candid conversations about what they can be doing better, what they're doing right. Last thing I would say, I really appreciate about the title of this is when we talk about equitable distribution power, equity. You know, I think sometimes we get into a question about whether we want equality. I think the word equity is good because, look, speaking as an East Asian American male, I recognize that I enjoy certain privileges, right? So if I'm saying that we should be all treated equally, that's not right because the reality is different communities have suffered in different ways. And so what we want is equitable treatment that we have you know, that we have in our, our society. You know, I'm not saying that I should have certain privileges. You know, what, what we are all saying is that we should have that, that portion that is proportioned to sort of our place in society. Um, sort of thinking about uh, John, what you just said and Carmen, what you said, uh, we're talking about, I'm hearing this idea of uh, redistribution versus representation um, and sort of two different levels, right? 
So we're thinking about sort of the structural as, as, as John is sort of alluding to, right? And maybe the more sort of interpersonal or within a particular organization as Carmen was kind of talking about within the philanthropic world. Um, a question that I have is, um, what are the relationships between the two, right? Uh, how does sort of working towards uh, the redistribution of power and per not, perhaps not just a long sort of uh, identitarian or, 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 or sort of uh, re representative lines as Carmen kind of alluded to that being a problem, um, but how, how, how might we think about the equitable uh, distribution or redistribution of power and resources within our organizations, within our institutions, um, as relating to this broader sort of structural goal, as John was alluding to. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is Eric Ward of, of Western State Center. I think uh, I'm going to be, I haven't been provocative today, so uh, I'm, I'm going to try to be a little provocative uh, right now. Uh, I think the interrelationship between those two is one of the critical questions right now. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way to folks. Uh, uh, you know, uh, look, don't, don't go literalist on me, right? I, I'm just going to try to open up some space here and suggest something. The, the actual argument over whether we should be a multiracial society is, uh, uh, is actually one for the most part that the racial justice movement has won. How do I know we've won this, right? Because I can actually even look into the social movements that oppose multiracialism, right? Uh, I can look at the white nationalist movement. We can look at the Proud Boys and alt-right. We can look at the Christian nationalist social movement in this country. We can look at some of the uh, uh, most significant oppositions to multiracialism in this country and see that they are also committed to building multiracial leadership, or at least in the sense of presence, right, within those movements. They also have come to understand, right, that uh, uh, the idea of a diverse America, right, is a argument that is, that is long over. And the debate right now is what do we do with a diverse America? And that's why systems become uh, critically important. Right. If we stop merely at the presence of people of color, right, within institutions, within particularly uh, boards, right, and, and systems of, of governance, uh, we begin to lean into a conversation of tokenism, right, rather than the transformation of a society, right, that has benefited off of inequality. So I, I think we're in a moment right now where the question of diversity is, is actually a, a, a rhetorical debate in this country. The question now is how do we begin to practice diversity? How do we begin to practice? And the practice comes in the form of equity. But, but here's the, the secret here and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. I think that conversation around equity is much more complicated and, and nuanced than this society will uh, uh, allow for. And that is why the shifting of leadership structures uh, becomes so important in this moment. And I'm not, I'm not up here, Carmen, I, I promise. I, I'm not gonna uh, sit up here and, and praise you for the entire panel, just a little bit of it, right? But I, I think of uh, an example of this, right? I come out of philanthropy. I'm currently the board of, of the Proteus Fund. Right, a phenomenal uh, foundation, diverse governorship. Right, many of us have been in and outside of philanthropy. Perhaps some who are listening here, but you know, I think the shift in leadership that is not just present, but actually has agency, has quick and tangible outcomes. And so I look at the work of like Carmen. I look at folks like Crystal Haling from Libra, Lorraine Ramirez from Funders for Justice. And they came with a very simple proposition uh, into the world of philanthropy. They actually argued that equity was not as complicated as we were all making out. That if we brought forward leadership, right, and gave them agency, not just presence, right, but agency within those institutions, and that these were leaders who were connected and felt accountable, right, to the most marginalized in our communities, that institutions would begin to change and transform and become stronger uh, fairly quickly. 
And I think over the last uh, couple of years, we can see that within philanthropy. And so I think philanthropy becomes a very interesting case study in this moment of transformational change, right? Not just for philanthropy, but in terms of the way we apply governance. Because at the end of the day, look, the goal is to ensure that everyone, right, in this country can live, love, worship, right, and work free from fear and bigotry, that they get to embrace the opportunity and self-actualize their lives and, and the lives of their communities. That doesn't happen just from protest, though it is important. It doesn't happen just from litigation, though that is also critical. At the end of the day, it, it comes from governance and has marginalized communities who have perpetually been kept out of institutions of governance. The only way we can begin to learn right, is, is to practice. But the only way we can practice is to open up space. But we have a burden because of systemic racism and also systemic uh, sexism in our society and, and class bias. The, the burden is, is that we don't get 30 years to practice, sadly, unfair, but we don't. What we get, right, is the chance to practice and to show immediate tangible results. And that's why I think the conversation around what is happening inside of philanthropy right now becomes such a critical one. It's one of the case studies where we really can unpack and look at these questions and understand the challenges and what has it. Probably wasn't that provocative. No. Like threw in a compliment in there. So it's like so distracting the, the, the provocation really like <laughs> you brought down the heat with a little bit of like hugging <laughs> but carmen it oh i know see look at me now about to ask a question but but there has i mean there have been real challenges over the last right there have been real advances over the last year but but is it accurate to say like it we it almost feels like there is kind of a, a backlash right or a recoiling to some of those advances uh, that have been made. Is, is that accurate? And how oh, do we absolutely. apply to those? And this goes to like John's question about the corporate sector. Like if we just took a moment in time, which is the murder of George Floyd and the 60 days after, and every single private sector philanthropic rich person in this country came out with a commitment to black people. And what happened, what like 12 months in we know is that either dollars weren't delivered. So people were like $1 billion. And they were actually like $1 billion to pay my company to help you black people set up businesses. The second thing is that people, even in our sector, even the best and brightest and most progressive were hamstrung within their institutions from naming the police as a perpetrator of violence, of being able to say that people took to the streets during a pandemic not because we needed more black entrepreneurs or black coders or black CEOs. It's because the police were targeting and killing black people. And so I feel like um, one of my, I'm, it like warms my heart, your hope for us. And I do believe that the philanthropic sector is like, um, can be a leading edge of both systemic and organizational reform, but it actually, um, uh, requires a commitment from the top to the bottom of institutions, a belief that something else is possible and that we can actually see that and not like a, a recoil. I do think like I have in the first six, I started in June of 2020. The first six months I was invited to 100 panels on anti-racism. And now I'm invited to 100 uh, panels about how do I get along with my right-wing colleagues uh, in philanthropy. And so there's like a really, and I think that you all do like a really interesting like um, matrix dance around it. I don't think it's my job to do that dance um, because there's too many people in our sector doing that or that need to do that dance right now. Sorry, Mary. Oh, no, no, no. I think that this is a, this is a great conversation. Um, and I think that this is really thinking about, the, thinking back to the title of this panel, right? Uh, it's thinking about a sort of uh, a long arc, right? And that there are advances and that there are pushbacks. So, you know, it, 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 it's a process. Um, one of the questions that I sort of had, um, and maybe I'll start with Halima this time, um, leading from this conversation, right? 
Uh, and I'm I'm really thinking about something that that um, that Eric said in particular about uh, sort of inter intra organizational dynamics and having to give um, you know uh, executive directors say uh, the power to actually <laughs> do the things that they want to do. Um, I have a question about. Uh, what that sort of looked like in your respective organizations. Halima, you're in this amazing sort of think tank that, you know, I was looking over all of your reports, touching at so many different facets of uh, BIPOC life in the UK, uh, particularly in, in London urban areas. Um, how, how are, uh, has sort of diversification of um, researchers and board members uh, been something that you've have been contending with, been having to contend with? Um, everyone else's organizations are these things that have shifted a lot within the past, you know, 18 months? Uh, and if so, how so? Thank you, Mary. And really great to be here with US colleagues. I feel um, like I'm the UK sole representative, but I can't really speak about all of that experience in the UK. But I'll try and give you a flavor of how some of these conversations are panning out. Um, because I'm not allowed out unless I say this, please follow us on Twitter, Halima underscore Begum. We're very democratic at work. Um, yeah, so I suppose, I mean, I'm just gonna start with the comment that I think, um, Carmen, it, it wasn't a lack of diversity that led to the murder of George Floyd. Actually, the streets of US and London streets are quite diverse. It wasn't that that led to the murder of George Floyd. There was something systemic and institutional. And therefore, I think that question about diversity and its link to representation, and therefore, what is the redistribution of power connection comes to play, right? Because you can have all the diversity and representation in the world, but if it doesn't bring about a change in reality to transform people's lives, then it's diversity for diversity's sake, it's representation for representation's sake. And, you know, quite literally across the pond and here, I'd say that we have, certainly in political uh, structures, quite a lot of diverse representation. But if we don't follow that with some level of power redistribution and resource transfer, then, then, then something's not sticking. What we've seen in the last 18 months, certainly, is people's perception of um, what diversity is and isn't and its limitations come to bear. Because I think most people thought, well, you know, if you have more diversity, more representation, we'll have less uh, black people being killed in the streets or stop and search and so on. Or if you have more diversity, uh, something like COVID is in theory indiscriminate. Everybody's affected in the same way, but guess what? Certain minorities were disproportionately impacted, hit hardest. So I think for many people, it became quite clear that equity is probably the conversation we want to have, but people didn't have access to that discourse. So in the UK, for many, many, many years, we've talked about the rhetoric of an equality of opportunity. So at the level of the law, everybody has equal access to services, representation, you name it. But if you then look at the outcomes, those outcomes don't seem to stack up to the equality call opportunities landscape. So what we've been trying to advance is, well, in order to get from equality to outcomes, there's this thing called equity. We want equitable outcomes. And, and it's that what we've been pushing, you know, equitable outcomes. Yes, equality of opportunity, but if you don't have equality of outcomes, sorry, it's not working. What we're now seeing though is a bit of pushback in certain quarters from that focus on outcomes. So they want to go back to equality of opportunity, notions like fairness and meritocracy. Well, you know, it's a fair country. Uh, you all have the same opportunity. So therefore there must be something terribly wrong in individual families or individual communities that you must fix yourselves. We've heard these arguments with gender, haven't we? So rather than thinking about fixing impacted communities, we need to think about fixing the structure and the environment. So I think that, Discourse is happening, not happening fast enough. But what we have noticed is corporates, they, they really have started shifting their tone a bit because I think corporates on the whole were the most removed from that reality of racism. But then they, something really important happened in the last 18 months that kind of like, you know, the, 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 the curtains kind of fell down. And I think they realized how much racism still exists. And what we now see is corporates scrambling to do the right thing. 
scrambling to do the right thing. Now, some of it started off with slogans, some of it started off with rhetoric, some of it was quite engaged, actually. So what we saw was a lot of staff and employees from companies. So a lot of the initiatives that you see from the big companies didn't come from the very top, by the way, it actually came from staff, ordinary workers and employees who were saying, oh my God, um, I, th I thought that this thing called racism was the thing that the KKK did. Turns out that it can happen in, in a living room where my children can access the TV. So I think that shifted. And so corporates are now looking, do something systemic. They need a lot of help, but I think there's, there, there's a commitment there. They need a lot of help. And so we've, we've been approached by a lot of corporates who have said, look, we want to do something systemic, but we don't know what it is. And we need some help. Now, that honesty is appreciated far more than slogans and one-off donations, which is just about this year. But to your point about leadership and what we need to see happen uh, inside firms, unless we see power invested with responsibility or representation with responsibility and agency, I think we're back to the drawing boards again around equality and representation. Senior leadership need to kind of take a handle of this and think, right, I want to see change happen in the next five years, not in the next 50 years. Because if we just left it at the level of representation, I think it's steady, slow progress. And what's really different this year, unlike um, maybe many, many years ago, is that young people these days, I mean, then they're impatient. I mean, they want their rights right now. And you know what? I love it. I absolutely love the fact that young people these days are on demand. They want it. Why should they not want democracy and rights and right now? So I think it's, it's young people's attitudes that have shifted. It's, it's corporates that are wanting more. So I think there's a lot to play for. Um, there's a lot of a dance here as well in terms of like motivating corporates who want to do the right thing and getting them to do the right thing. But I would rather play that dance than give way to a growing right wing who really doesn't want to go to the ball at all, right? Because they can see that some of these corporates or the ordinary person who's stuck in the middle kind of is uncomfortable with racism, never wanted to do something before, but right now they might want to do something. I'm quite keen on saying, okay, let's talk about this. Whereas the right wing there is thinking, oh my God, for once anti-racists have a chance to kind of like really go into the heartlands, winning hearts and minds, and we must stop that. That's my worry. Like, how do you stabilize how do you keep at bay the right wing, both in the US and here? Can I pick up on something that Halima said that I think is very valuable, which is, I mean, there's a lot of things that you said that are very valuable. One, one piece in particular is about how employees at many of the corporations really drove change. And I completely agree with that. So obviously everyone knows that over this past two years, it's been incredibly hard on the Asian American community, you know, with respect to the anti-Asian violence, with the murder of six Asian American women earlier this year in March. And we had the same thing happen to a certain extent is that there are a lot of corporations came out to support the Asian American community, sort of offer contributions or say, hey, what can we do to help? And some of it was, a, you would call it tokenism. Some of it was just, just sort of throwing dollars and then hoping it would go away. But where I thought it was most effective was when the, the C-suite said to their employees, hey, we don't know what to do here. We recognize there's a problem. You guys as employees that are from the Asian community help us figure this out, right? And it gave them a voice and they came up with much better solutions in some ways. So part of this, right, is if corporations know when to sort of seed the ground, if you will, right, let their employees guide them and trust that their employees are looking out for all of their collective best interests, including the corporation's interests, it, it really does make a difference. I, there's two other points I, I would want to make about this. One is, I think what all of you have been talking about with respect to, yeah, there's structures that can be changed, but then we have to look beyond them as well. I think that's important. There's, there's an article that came out, I think it was in the Washington Post the last couple of days, that talked about how even for the free, female Supreme Court justices, they are constantly interrupted more than the male Supreme Court justices, and not just by other justices but that by the advocates, the lawyers themselves, the lawyers that are supposed to be ultra respectful of uh, the, the justices. So that tells you something, right? Is even at the most pinnacle of power, right? It can't be just the fact that they're there is not enough. We need to ensure that their voices are heard. And that is true at the Supreme Court. That is true in C-suite and boardrooms. Just having diversity, as, as you guys are saying, for diversity at stake is not enough. 
if the other people don't recognize that, the reason that they're there is that, that they need to have a voice. I think the last piece I want to make sure we all think about is the role of truth in all of it. And I hate that we have to say that, but one of the fights that all of us need to engage in is against misinformation and disinformation. Let's be clear. There is a campaign out there that is trying to distort a lot of what is happening in society. And that is where, again, vulnerable communities are the most vulnerable. We see it in the coverage of George Floyd about how oh, he was using drugs or something like that. We see it in the coverage of welfare and of some of the support systems, like you know the SNAP program or, or other things that how these people are not working hard enough and that's why they're in these programs. We have to make sure we get the truth out there, right? And, and I, that's easy to say, it's hard to do, but I think, again, this is where we need to be systemic about it. Part of it is the responsibility of the platforms, if you will, the Facebooks, the Twitters, what are they doing to prevent false information from getting out there? Part of it is on all of us to make sure that we are contributing to getting the right information that is out there. And part of it is also incumbent on the government and the corporations to make sure that they stand up for truth, right? Too often we engage in this relativism that it's like, well, we don't want to, we want to protect free speech. This is the free speech we're talking about. You know, in 2020, like it or not, Joe Biden won the election. I mean, there's, there's no, well, on the other hand, about that, right? And so when, when news platforms give way to that and say, well, there's an argument being made. Yeah, there's an argument being made that the moon is made of cheese, but let's be serious, right? And, and we should call that out and people have to be willing to call that out. I think that's also the threat right now that all of us face. And again, it is most often borne by the most vulnerable communities, which include all of us in the communities of color. I, I love that, that comment, um, John. And um, I would love to hear other people's thought, uh, thoughts about sort of uh, the ways in which they think their respective organizations are really concerned with this, 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 uh, this issue of truth, right? And knowledge production uh, in service of, of more equitable or certainly at least less violent futures. I feel like the tension that like I'm at least confronting and I, and I feel like Eric and I have been like, you know, in my imagination, I am in a pretty uh, good conversation with you, Eric, about this issue where I believe that we actually need to name the enemies and the people who are actively targeting our communities. That there has to be a naming of the individuals, there has to be naming of the corporate leaders, there has to be a naming of the political, the people who we have elected to office who are actively either stoking fires that lead to deep, like the deepening of white supremacy, the calcifying of white supremacy in our political and economic institutions. Um, and or are profiting off of it. And that we need an actual like a regulatory regime. And I, um, one of the hard things for me is that I'm clear that there are two levels. Mary, you like keep on like intimating at this, right? That there's like a structural systemic level and then there's the interpersonal level. And like, where do we need to meet people to bring them along in a journey? And I, the question like, that I am continually grappling with is like how often do we need to concede like the way that I imagine it in the worst case scenario is sitting across sit, needing to be in conversation um with Steve Bannon with with Steve Miller like that's like the that for me is like the um, and needing to be in conversation in a way that actually creates the room and the aperture to to see his humanity right like that is the interpersonal uh, shifts that I feel like we often um, default to of um, wanting to bring people along. And to be honest, like, I don't buy it. Like, I don't want, I don't want to do it. I don't want people in my organization to need to do it. I don't want my mom to need to do it. My cousin, my worst, my worst relative to need to do it. My worst enemy to need to do it. And, and I know it's work that needs to be done. And so I feel like the tension that's like, uh, emerging for me in this conversation is that there is a structural and systemic that actually uh, lives in the realm of the 
culture, norms, rules of how we engage with each other, setting the table for how we eat with each other. And then there's like what we eat and like the interpersonal, like what we talk about at the dinner table, like the interpersonal things. And I wonder like for my co-panelists, like how do we engage with both of these seemingly different, but definitely intertwined challenges uh, in ways that are authentic and true. And frankly, in ways that don't require people of color to sacrifice themselves, because that's where it all, like the leading edges is like, you're kind of a jerk, Carmen, you know, not all white, like the start for me is like, not all white people are bad. I'm like, clearly not all white people are bad, but white supremacy is bad. <laughs> like we have to like, we have to be able to walk and chew gum and name these things. And so Eric, I would just love to like be, Eric, John, and Alima, like, how do we hold that there are people that we're talking about as good or like making a change who have like gotten rich off of advancing white supremacy, white supremacist agendas or anti-Black agendas or anti-Asian agendas and anti-immigrant agendas and the need that we need more people like in order to have, like it ha the democracy has to include all of us. Eric, I think you're on mute. Uh, we can't hear you. Oh. 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 While we wait for Eric, well, one question I have for you, Carmen, is do we need to engage with the Stephen Millers and the Bannons of the world? At least for me, like, I think I don't want to, well, I agree with you, I don't want to engage with them, but like, I can we just, put them to the side and say, these people we don't engage with, but the people they are trying to influence, those are the ones that we need to engage with. And they, that even there, it's very, very hard work, right? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like um, we are in a moment where racial justice work is really bifurcated and, it, and it's not coming together in a way that, way that feels, feels clear. clear. I'm here and I'm my part, so I'm not sure if that's me. I'm gonna keep on top, I'm good, okay. And it feels bifurcated where I feel like it's an extreme, John, where we're like, um, we have to be able to be in conversation with the worst of us, of us, of our people, of, of people here. And um, we need to do the work that you're gonna do, but I also don't wanna do that work. I'm just not gonna lie, like I don't, I don't wanna do it. <laughs> but I feel like it's work that we need to practice doing. Um, <laughs> And it's a challenge. It feels hard. Try this, Carmen. Can can I'm gonna pretend like everyone can hear me right now? I don't oh, know. Yeah, if we can hear you. Hear me. We but can. um, I'm I'm just gonna speak for a second. Of course, I started to get lag just as soon as you asked this amazing question, and um, I think this is like this is one of those complicated questions. Here, here's here's my quick take. Uh, I'm not interested in being in a room with with uh. Steve Bannon or, or, or Steve Miller, right? I, there, there's no value uh, 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 in it. Uh, not because I don't recognize their, their humanity, right? But that they have adopted such a different set of principles and ideology that I don't know what the common ground is that doesn't result, right? In the selling out of other marginalized communities. Right. So there's I don't understand how we could find uh, uh, that common ground. I do think, though, we should be contesting the institutions that they seek to govern. Right. Mm -hmm. To create right, this exclusive form uh, of, of democracy. And the real question, you know, in the United States is what do you do with the constituency that they primarily seek to recruit from, which is the, the, the white population in America? Do, do we ignore it, right? Or do we compete for that constituency? And if we compete for that constituency, how then do we do that in a way that I think is principled? And we wrestle with that, right? Western State Center, uh, uh, I think now in 2003, uh, uh, so nearly 20 years ago, we have released, we released one of the foundational toolkits and modules on addressing systemic racism, right? It helped to build 
much of, of uh, the conversation that happens today uh, around systemic racism. We continue that work, right, with our Northwest Equity Lab, which invests in uh, EDI, equity, diversity, uh, inclusion, uh, uh, key staff, right, in government and in, in large institutions. And one of the pieces we've come to, I think, with supportive groups like Race Forward is, is to understand at the end of the day, for Western State Center at least, the path we've carved out is not the one of personal grievance, right? So we're not doing a lot of investment, uh, uh, because not because we think less of it, but we are not doing that investment in kind of the, inter, the individual development, right? The, the personnel, the personal development uh, that many do around EDI. At the end of the day, because of the external conditions, we've decided, look, uh, whether people are prejudiced or not, is less important than how our systems respond to that prejudice, right? And for our systems to offset, right, that socialization of prejudice, it means that the governance of that system needs to be uh, both diverse and present, right, but connected, right, to the actual uh, understanding of the systems of discrimination uh, that are played. I'm going to name some names, right? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, some of this because I think that work around systems change has created a different dialogue and so has the tens of thousands of people who took to the streets, right, in result of uh, uh, police killings. Now, look, I'm not a person who says, oh, that mobilization appeared out of nowhere. I, I'm, I'm too old for that, right? I know that that was a result of generations of struggle and infrastructure building and expansions, not just of movements, right? But in the way that we have moved society to a point where more white Americans today, right, are supportive of Black Lives Matter then we're supportive of Martin Luther King. And I mean, by percentage, right? By percentage, more white people today support Black Lives Matter than ever supported Martin Luther King Jr. in his lifetime. That is the arc of change. And we know change is slow, but I'm an urgent kind of guy. And so I think we need to, to, to move this way. I think there's a real danger right now in not holding businesses to the moral principle of anti-racism. Let's be clear, right? Anti-racism is a value, not an ideology, right? That means racism is also a value. And when businesses promote and allow space for racism, they are practicing a value. When AT&T, yes, I named them, gives money for the founding of One American News, right? One of the leading flagships for the alt-right and white nationalist movement in this country, right? Movements that have engaged in violence that have taken more lives of Americans through ideological violence than any other social movement in this country, right? Over the last 10 years, we have a problem with corporate values. In, and what they'll tell us is that this is all about profit. But we can't believe the lies, as John said anymore. We know this is a not profit. Citibank, Citigroup itself released a study last year documenting that this country has lost more than $11 trillion, right, in the last decade from discrimination just against the Black community. I'm not even talking about immigrants, Latinos, the Asian American community, or Native Americans. This country has lost 11 million. And let's not be value neutral on that loss. That loss has mostly come on the backs, right, of African-Americans and those who have gained from it have been primarily white. And so I do think where we are in agreement, right, is the idea that personal grievance is less important than building the governance structures necessary to engage systems. And the question of white constituencies is a complicated one. I think it's set by time and place in this country. I think it's set by the organization and its mission statement. But I do believe this, where I push back against the idea that we simply need to go out and have dialogues with uh, white communities is this. It is always proposition on the idea that we need to kind of lower, right, 
uh, our expectations and engage the white constituency around a plethora of other issues, right? Everything but the conversation around race. At Western State Center, the, the difference for us is we actually believe white people have a self-interest in opposing racism in this society, systemic racism, not an allyship role, right? Not a supporter role. They have a direct self-interest. And when white people identify and white institutions identify uh, uh, that self-interest, they begin the process of systemic uh, 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 transformation. And hopefully personal growth comes with that. But I didn't come into this work, right? To be a personal counselor, right? Or to be someone's press professional development person. I came in to open up the space, right? For liberation and opportunity for communities who have been denied that too far in a society that claims to be a democracy. So I think we, we, we agree. And there are real questions uh, around how we engage white constituencies. That was very long, but since I lost my headphones, I went on. Thank you. No, thank you so much for that. And I think, um, Halima, did you have something to say about this as well? Yeah, I mean, it was, well, I think I've moved on from that point, but I will say it anyway. Um, I don't, I, I think, um, was it John, you said, I don't want to be in a room with Steve Bannon. I'm quite clear about that. I know lots of other people I don't want to be in a room with. Um, the reason for that is that for me to be engaged in a room with the, uh, the other side, we have to commit to some principles of no harm. If I feel that my interests are harmed there, I will not get into a room with them. So don't ask me to self-harm myself, I won't do it. What I am interested in is though, the people and the communities that his followers are targeting. And I'll tell you why I'm interested in them. Because the story of racism is not complete, sorry, the story of anti-racism is not complete until it becomes a story of us. If we only worked with our supporters and followers, then I think it's a story about them. When it's a story about us and our society, that includes uh, our, our white friends and allies, and indeed our white friends who might have a self-interest as well. So that's why I'm quite keen on working there. But but like you, Eric, I, I don't think that conversation should be about individually converting somebody's views as though we all live in a liberal democracy and they want to espouse hate. You know, that's that's not what I'm interested in doing. I'm interested in making sure that that hate doesn't ever touch large numbers of people from my communities. That means building the power, the resources and everything within our structures to make sure that the harm is mitigated. So I, I don't mind the individual racist or the bad apple here and there. What I mind is whether their views has cultural norm, normalcy, is institutionalized, because that has devastating consequences on our children and our children's children. And that's the structure piece, I think. I think that is about empathy, isn't it? Ultimately, we care about a, a legacy we leave behind for our children, so they never go through what we had to go through. But that does mean working with white society as well, but not the Steve Bannons. And, their likes. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing from you all is this really important distinction being made between sort of individual sort of prejudice, right? And and, and racism as being prejudice plus power, right? Um, that ability to, to sort of actually shape uh, our lives uh, to do harm. Um, so I'm going to switch over really quickly. Um, we have quite a few questions from um, the audience uh, and only about 10 minutes. Um, so I'm, I, I, I'm going to start with one question um, from, from someone who's registered for the conference. Um, and they write, um, they're particularly interested uh, in hearing about uh, communities that have established systems of public accountability, particularly as that accountability relates to spending and contracts uh, in construction and infrastructure projects. Um, and, and here they're thinking about diverse hiring and spending. Uh, they say moreover, I'm very interested in learning about how local communities have leveraged uh, respective public, private and philanthropic relationships or partnerships to establish ongoing systems of transparency and accountability to benefit local businesses um, that are legitimately owned by people of color. So I, I, yeah, I think that, oh, somebody has something to say? Yeah. Let me 
start perhaps? I, so I serve on the diversity council of a, a number of corporations. And, and so we get into these discussions about supplier diversity and sort of, sort of who, who corporations are contracting with. I guess there's a couple of things that come out to me as best practices, maybe, if that's sort of where we're, the, this question is going. Number one, I would say, is public transparency. I, I find the corporations that are willing to open up their books, so to speak, and take those hard questions are corporations that are more likely to change and be willing to listen. The ones that are a little bit more closed or a little bit more defensive about the fact that, well, this data, we're not sure, but, you know, we have different flaws in our data, so we, we don't, we want to iron it out before uh, we reveal to everyone. I, those are the ones that are resistant to change. Uh, but then it gets to, I think a number of people have talked about this also is, it gets further than that is also because like when you talk about minority owned businesses, for example, there are too often that sort of you could find uh, sort of a, a minority that owns a business. But really, you know, if you look beneath the surface, it, it, it goes to this tokenism idea. Right. So a, a part of this is making sure that sort of those numbers actually back up sort of what they what a corporation is trying to uh, project. Right. Because, you know, I, for example, uh, and I don't need to, to name the company. I had a company that was looking at their supplier diversity. They said they had a huge amount of Asian diversity. I asked them about it. It turns out they were from Asia, literally from Asia. Right. <laughs> so, OK, yes, you have supplier diversity because you have a lot of manufacturing coming from Asia. That's not diversity, you know, at least the way I would define it. So, again, so we got to kick the tires. We got to ask the hard questions. Uh, if, if we are really trying to assess it. Yeah. I would say like from a community perspective, there's an amazing leader here in Seattle named Nikita Oliver, who runs an organization called Creative Justice that's been doing a ton of work looking at how public dollars are spent in service of a whole host of things. So like we all know um, we are in the midst of what could, can quite possibly be the largest public investment in US history in people. And so I know there are community organizations across the country um, who are actually working with local residents to make sure that like the money is understood as like a collective investment in us, a collective investment in our institutions, a collective investment into our future. And so I'll just like name as like a for practice, practical, uh, uh, intense. I think that there are a number of local community-based organizations um, that are making sure that people who have long been excluded from the conversations about how we spend our money are front and center uh, at informing the agenda of public dollars and public spending. Thank you. Oh, someone. Thank you so much for giving that really clear example uh, of someone that we might look to, particularly for uh, sort of community pressure um, in making sure that uh, that 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 uh, communities are actually seeing these benefits. Um, and thank you so much, John, for really kind of highlighting the best practices for uh, private industry in terms of actually, like you said, opening their books. <laughs> um, the second question that I have. Uh, from, from the audience as uh, uh, someone writes, time is in the title. Uh, how do you feel like time functions and racial justice organizing and institutional transformation? Uh, and are white people patient enough to engage in the long haul? No, no. Uh, 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 sorry, white folks. And this is not, uh, uh, it's, it's because of privilege in society, right? It's, it's not because of whiteness. Uh, uh, males uh, in society, for the most part, also have this problem, right? Where uh, uh, we're urgent uh, with all the wrong things, right? And uh, not only urgent with many of the wrong things, uh, uh, but when it meets up against our privilege, when we realize that racism, systemic racism, is actually uh, more powerful than even uh, an individual's white privilege, it creates a discombobulation uh, uh, that uh, is hard for white folks to, to, to understand. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's for white leadership to, to understand 
right? That this is not a, a fight that started, uh, it's going to sound contradictory, but I promise it's not when we're done. We have to understand, right? If, if, you know, if you are a white person dealing with racism, right? If you are a man dealing with sexism and uh, uh, issues of, of uh, gender discrimination in this society, right? Cis, you, you have to understand that the arcs of those struggles are much longer than you realize, right? And, and can hold. Right. And so uh, many of us have been watching these struggles through generations uh, and there has been great progress. Right. Not where we want to be. Right. But there has been progress. And the other piece, though, is that that is not an excuse to not be uh, 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 serious and disciplined about this. Right. Often what happens is when people get frustrated. Uh, 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 they quit or they leave, which is also a privilege, right? Most people of color don't get that choice uh, uh, to leave. This is their reality day in and and day out. On the other hand, right, we have to understand, uh, we have to stop this idea that solving racism is super complicated. It's not that complicated. It just takes public will, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we we need to, to do a better job all right, of white folks not feeling that understanding racism is now like a new kind of uh, association, that, uh, uh, a popular association that you get to belong to that other white folks don't get to belong to or have to go through these rituals uh, uh, to belong to it. And that has been one of the problems with EDI, right? One of the bad outcomes over the 10 years, right, is that it's become much more of a social club right, then a set of tools to address systemic change. That's why there's this overemphasis on personal development, right? White people who have entered this movement have uh, profited, have become substantially better, right, at their jobs, right? But the conditions haven't changed for people of color. And that's because white folks are not opening up enough space to bring in other white folks uh, uh, into this work. So yes, uh, uh, folks are impatient uh, 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 but around all the all the wrong things, this is a long arc struggle. But we need more folks, and you need to stop telling other white people that this is super complicated to solve. You're not helping us. Sort of other any other thoughts on on um, you know? I think I'm hearing from Eric the. This, this notion of uh, discombobulation. And it also sounds like, um, what do they call it? Ally fatigue, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting turn of phrase. Um, um, but yeah, so I, I, anybody else sort of thinking about uh, this idea or that this, you know, that this issue of time, right? Um, uh, and how, how might you address it in your own practice and your own in, uh, organizations, right? Um, the fact that um, immediate change very rarely happens. Um, you know, there, there may be a working towards a particular campaign and there can be victories, but we know more often than not, uh, those are long and hard battles. I feel like Angela Davis wrote the book, right? Freedom is a constant struggle. And mm -hmm. as we work in the fight for freedom, um, there are always going to be oppositional forces. And I feel like our orientation needs to change away from um, sort of like short-term small victories and gains and towards starting to see the ground for the world and country that we know is possible. And that's gonna always take like, it's like a garden. It's always going to take work. And I feel like our, our sector, our movements are frankly, because of how philanthropy has been structured and organized, is only incentivized to have like material real gains, not to sustain those gains, not to realize those gains, and not to actually expand those gains or um, to build on those gains in service of this future world. So like for me, time, um, time talking about time creates a, ta a trap around legacy and personal mm -hmm. contribution and attribution for victory. And it makes it seem like one person did one thing and that led to all of these other things. And we just know 
you know, historically that that's just not true, that every great movement leader that everybody always lifts up was always tethered to a broader community of people, both in the past and into the future, that were able to keep their victories alive. And that for me is like the key of movement work is that it's like not tethered to uh, a destination, but we need to have greater discipline about the constant nature of the struggle for freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Halima, I think I saw your hand as well. Yeah, no, I, w I was just um, in a conversation yesterday about actually the, the timing issue. And obviously everybody around the room said, well, we've been on this movement piece for a really, really long time. So the question of timing is who's timing? And the consensus was that what's particularly timely now is that the movement is being met by the other side because the movement always existed, but it just wasn't getting that traction from uh, wider uh, sections and demographics in society. So given the fact that that, that fusion, uh, what's, a, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Not fusion, that, that contact point has happened. I think there's a lot that can be gained from that contact point that we might not gain in other periods when the movement is perhaps feeling slow and cumbersome. What we say to a lot of our friends is that that opportunity, that window, that portal isn't going to stay open, right, forever. What is it that we must do now to crowdsource in the assets, the power, the networks, so that we can keep that portal open for longer? Because if we just relied on other people's uh, preferences, timings, they might just move on to saving the planet. They should do, by the way. We should all be saving the planet. Do you see what I mean? So our responsibility is to make sure that people don't wane, people don't lose interest, because for sure they will. As human beings, we tend to be a little bit apathetic and possibly a bit lazy. But our role is to make sure that that door, that portal stays open as long as possible. And that, that's partly the work. This is, this is what I see in race equity organizations now. We, we've existed since 1968. We've always done this work. But there's something very particular at this moment where I feel well, you know, if there are corporates scrambling, wanting to do the right thing, um, it's never going to happen again if we don't kind of ride on this, like make that space bigger than it already was. So I think it's on us to kind of make sure that the time people just don't lose interest. We've just got to work harder, right? Well, uh, unfortunately, thank you so much uh, with that, that that closing idea, right? That we just have to work harder. And also, as Carmen was saying, that, uh, that that practice of working towards freedom, it's a constant struggle, uh, to paraphrase. Uh, Dr. Davis, uh, unfortunately, we are all out of time, um, but thank you all so much for being in conversation today. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation and I, I hope that all of our, our, many, our many participants and audience members do as well. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mary, for moderating the great panel. Uh, it's good to uh, hear these ideas. Uh, so allow me to quickly uh, introduce our next special guest uh, is Kim Michelle Janey, Mayor of Boston, who will offer us some closing reflections and remarks. Mayor Janey is our living embodiment of Boston history from experiencing the battle of desegregation in the Boston public schools through uh, the busting era of the 1970s to 45 years later, making history as the first woman mayor and first black mayor of Boston. Um, so no more, uh, no more introduction is needed. Uh, mayor Janie, please take us away. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Angel. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Professor Khalil Gibran Mohammed, uh, the Institutional Anti-Racism Accountability Project in the Harvard Kennedy Schools Ash Center for hosting at this event, this important conversation. I wanna thank everyone who is in attendance and certainly to all of the speakers uh, for your critical insights. When I first came into office, I promised this city bold and courageous leadership through a racial justice lens. It was that same lens that I used to fearlessly lead through the COVID-19 pandemic. I created a vaccine equity grant initiative and I invested $3 million to ensure that our vaccine efforts would reach residents of Boston who were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. 
My efforts around equitable vaccine distribution have been more than effective. As of Tuesday, October 11th, 82% of eligible Boston residents have received at least one dose of the vaccine. And under my leadership, we met people where they are, prioritizing hardest hit populations that were predominantly in black and brown communities. And since April, the vaccination rates for black and Latino population have increased uh, by 27% and 35%, uh, 35% respectively. Because of our tireless approach, Boston is one of the most vaccinated big cities in America. I've also supported our local small businesses and restaurants by allocating an additional $9.4 million to the Small Business Relief Fund and um, also the Restaurant Relief Fund. We created that to, to help uh, restaurants who were having a difficult time with the pandemic. This was in addition to the local uh, support that we gave to small businesses provided through earlier funds, including the Commercial Rent Relief Fund. This was a multi-million dollar investment uh, and it was not only needed, but it was necessary, especially since this investment helps to boost more black and brown businesses. My housing stability agenda was designed to support renters and homeowners across the city. As mayor of Boston, I invested $50 million in my very first week in the Boston Rental Relief Fund to support landlord, landlords and tenants uh, throughout this uh, recession. And that investment, 70% uh, has gone to communities of color. As someone who experienced housing insecurity in my life, housing justice is a very personal issue for me. And in the spirit of housing justice, I have expanded uh, the Boston Home Center's first time home buyers program with an investment of $2.4 million, increasing that down payment assistance from $10,000 to $40,000, quadrupling the amount of support that we provide to eligible home buyers in Boston. Home ownership is essential to building generational wealth in this country. As someone who purchased her first home through a first time home buyers program, I understand how significant home ownership can be to breaking the cycles of poverty in our country. And closing the racial wealth gap begins with closing the racial home ownership gap. As mayor, I've also worked to improve the city's practices around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Just last week, I signed an executive order marking the second Monday of every October as Indigenous Peoples Day. In drafting this executive order, I worked closely with many indigenous leaders, including one of today's speakers, Elizabeth Solomon. This acknowledgement of Boston's role in colonial displacement of dis indigenous people was long overdue. On the 402nd anniversary of the day enslaved Africans arrived on the shores of Virginia, August 20th, uh, 2022, um, well, not 2022, but I publicly acknowledge the hidden history of a well-known Boston landmark. Built between 1746 and 1749, the Shirley Eustis Mansion was one of the last remaining colonial governor's mansions in the original 13 colonies. This mansion is right in my home neighborhood of Roxbury. Uh, during Governor Shirley and Governor Eustis Tenure, the mansion and land were maintained by enslaved Africans and persons of African descent. Artifacts and pictures from those times convey that enslaved people, people occupied the barn. And for generations, this mansion has been celebrated in Boston and, na and nationally. People have gathered on its grounds to see the apple orchids, the rose gardens, to host weddings, among other celebratory events without knowing that the last remaining freestanding slave quarters in North, the Northeastern United States exists right here in the city of Boston. And then lifting up the enslaved people who contributed to the advancement of Boston has been an important part of the racial justice work that has been central to my administration. These times uh, call for police accountability and transparency. 
obviously. And this is why I launched the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency, investing uh, millions of dollars uh, to create that office. Uh, OPAT, as we call it, has the authority to review all Boston Police Department internal affair, affairs cases, subpoena the release records, and strengthen police accountability to the people of Boston. I've, I've made it a priority as mayor to bring safety, healing, and justice to Boston communities. And that means reimagining public safety in our city and delivering thoughtful solutions that address the problems that we face. I created a pilot initiative to improve how the Boston Police Department responds to mental health related 911 calls. Uh, these programs, these initiatives that I've put in place are to ensure that we are creating a safe and healthy Boston for future generations to enjoy. I invested a half million dollars and partnered with the MBTA to launch a free, a free bus fare pilot program. And this is really exciting to me uh, because I do not own a car and I still uh, take the MBTA whenever I can. Uh, the number 28 bus route carries nearly 13,000 people a day. It serves a vital connection for residents of Mattapan, Roxbury, and Dorchester to the MBTA subways and commuter rail networks. These neighborhoods, as folks may know, are largely black and underserved by the existing rail network. The families that live in these neighborhoods pay a higher percentage of their household income on transportation compared to most other neighborhoods and they spend 64 more hours commuting than white residents. More than two thirds of the riders on uh, the 28 bus route are classified as low income and the free boarding buses will lessen the cost to these riders. This pilot program makes transit more accessible and more affordable for black and brown neighbors, families and children. As mayor, I am committed to creating opportunities for all children across our city and in Boston public schools, of course. Over the summer, the Boston School Committee voted to address racial disparities uh, in Boston's exam schools by overhauling the admissions process, an issue I had championed long before I was an elected official. I appointed two promising Latina members to the Boston School Committee. These two women fill a representative void that was left in leadership. In a city where over 40% of BPS students identify as Latino, I know how impactful representation can be. I certainly know that as the first woman mayor and as the first black mayor of our city. And I am very committed to opportunities and safety for our young people both in and out of the classroom. Earlier this week, I announced the SWIM Safely Partnership between the city of Boston, the YMCA, uh, Boston Public Schools, the Boston Triathlon, and Save the, the Harbors Women of Color Coalition, along with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Mass. This partnership will work to prevent drownings by offering free swim lessons for children and adults at the Roxbury uh, YMCA, at the Dorchester YMCA, and the Hyde Park YMCA. This initiative will also help expand our lifeguard workforce by training up to 60 young people and create even more job opportunities for our city's youth. We are also exploring options for incorporating swim lessons into the third grade BPS curriculum. Swimming classes will provide additional benefits such as increased health benefits, uh, along with allowing everyone to enjoy our pools in Boston as well as, well as our beaches. This is particularly timely as we confront climate change, another issue that uh, impacts black and brown communities. In Boston, all over the world, we see how our climate is changing just this week. We've had 70 degree uh, temperatures in Boston. Uh, we have seen extreme heat all throughout the summer, stormwater flooding, uh, tornado warnings right here in the Northeast, uh, hurricanes, all of these events put our most vulnerable residents, particularly black and brown people in serious harm. They are disproportionately impacted by issues around climate justice. Uh, and this is why we've undertaken environmental initiatives that will help uh, protect our planet. 
just recently, I signed the Building Energy Reduction and Disclosure Ordinance, or BIRDO 2.0, to ensure that Boston's buildings are stepping up uh, to do their part to combat climate change. This ordinance was created with an equity lens to reduce carbon emissions, prioritize environmental justice, and create green jobs. It will also ensure that our young people and those who are most vulnerable have a safe future. Getting through such times require a coordinated plan and a little bit of joy. This is why I am so proud of my Joy Agenda, a citywide initiative to hold collective space for healing and processing the grief of the past year and a half. As mayor of Boston, I believe that emphasizing the power of joy can help us reconnect and reimagine what is possible. As mayor, I'm very proud of the work that my team has done to build a strong foundation for the next administration. And I know that if all of us continue to work together, we will come back as a stronger Boston and a city that is more equitable, more just, and more resilient. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you for those words and reflections, Madam Mayor, and also for really uh, showing us what some of these anti-racist policies really look like on the ground in the city like Boston. What are the, some, what are the efforts that it takes to pass them? And I know personally from working on your team before I started IRA, that this has always been a commitment that you've had uh, as city council president and that you were really able to implement as Boston mayor. So thank you again for being with us today. Um, and up next to really wrap us up is Professor Khalil Mohammed and also Erica Lick and who together will really uh, sum up some of the major points of our conference today. Um, and thank you everyone else for tuning in. Thank you, Aunt Cal. And uh, you know, behind the scenes, we make it happen here at Ira. Um, so let me just say, you know, wow, my mind is full, my heart is full, uh, my Twitter inbox is full, and I'm sure all of you are just kind of buzzing from the discussions today and also last night. And so I'm just really grateful to have the opportunity now to sit down with my dear colleague, mentor, um, scholar that I just get to kind of soak up from um, day to day and, and to really reflect on what we've heard and to both kind of make sense of just all of the meaty, you know, meaningful contributions that have been shared, um, but to also just take that pause, right? A lot of the best organizers in history that that we can and should be learning from have reminded us of the importance of the pause and the importance of you know, learning, learning from what we've been doing, learning from what's been done. And, and that's a great segue to uh, a conversation with a historian. Well, let me <laughs> so, just say before, before we jump in, thanks so much, Erica. I just wanna thank the mayor uh, for her time and for joining us. Uh, I know it's, it's a, a privilege to have her here and uh, in the, the time of remaining in the work that she has to do, she's already accomplished a lot, but uh, we want her to be as effective in leaving a legacy to build upon. Uh, and so uh, I just wanna say that in case she jumps off before we finish our conversation, so. Absolutely. And I think for us at IRA, we, um, it does, it's not lost on us, you know, where we sit as an institution, within an institution, you know, located in Cambridge and Boston, and, and really care deeply about those relationships to what folks in Boston are doing to advance racial justice and racial equity, like Mayor Janney. So absolutely. So Khalil, um, I'm curious to know, as a historian listening to everything today and last night, um, and as someone who's really studied you know, the breadths of ways that power in various forms, um, it can block change, it can push change forward. Um, we've heard from, you know, some of our panelists around the ways that we engage with power and particularly around how we frame, um, you know, what it is that we're trying to advance. And this morning, for instance, you know, Michael McAfee and Jared Conrad were both talking about you know, the ways that um, 
the fight for racial justice has in some ways, in some spaces morphed into a very transactional, you know, method of, you know, speaking the language of money and speaking the language um, of, you know, economic gain, economic goals, when actually it's really about humanity. It's about black humanity. It's about the humanity of indigenous people, people of color, other marginalized identity groups. And so I'm curious, you know, as someone who's learned a lot from the past, or at least, you know, kind of studied the past, what can we learn, you know, from the resistance we've seen in history to framing things, framing, I guess, the fight for racial justice um, as an active, you know, movement to actually combat, you know, forces of oppression. Uh, another way of saying this would be, you know, what do we need to learn from history to put these lessons into context? What context have you seen for understanding, you know, how we engage with power and the way in which we frame, you know, the, the movement for equity and equality? Well, I appreciate uh, thinking that um, I can channel all that, all that the past might teach us in, in the remaining time we have. But there are a couple of things in reminding me, as you just did about our first panel, uh, that uh, I am energized by the honesty of the day by the candor of the panelist and uh, where we began this conversation this morning with a recognition that the elite decision makers and that conversation largely centered on the private sector because of the question about uh, expanding the pie as uh, Dana Peterson noted. Um, you know, what Michael McAfee really pushed us to consider uh, is precisely that this work um, can't be finished in an election cycle or in a season of heightened awareness and concern about racial equity and justice. Um, when he said, you know, we've been held hostage to making the case for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, he was drawing on uh, historical lessons that uh, Toni Morrison said maybe more uh, expressly when she said, racism is designed to keep you distracted, to keep proving your worthiness, to keep proving your humanity. And if I think about this year's conference from last year's conference where we considered the business model, which was another variation of this similar argument, um, there was more inside, um, there was more inside assuredness by people working inside the space of DEI that they could work with the plumbing. That was a popular metaphor last year, that you could change the plumbing of these companies and would produce different outcomes. This year, something different was expressed, something a little bit uh, less, less uh, I, I don't, I'm trying everything I can to, to not use the word hopeful, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> which you know is not a word I use, but it was more real. And I think that's because since we are having a debate in this country about what our history is or was and what we should learn about the past, which is really a meta um, conversation about who we are as a people. And that is both within the, the confines of the United States and also globally. That uh, that first panel, I think, offered a greater sense of urgency that time's up. Uh, we're not going to spend another generation uh, just simply repeating the same thing that, uh, that we're all the same. That, that something's got to give. And, and therefore, um, you know, whether it is the economic argument, whether it is the moral argument, uh, or uh, some combination as, as uh, I think um, either Lisa Cook or Jarek noted, um, whether it's this, the self-interested argument that, you know, you simply have to appeal to people's self-interest. Um, I think Cheryl Mills got at this a bit in her comments about uh, serving in governance roles. Um, I took away from that first panel 
that history teaches those folks that the pathway for accepting the usual resistance is narrowing, that the little island of make-believe is getting smaller. And in that sense, I think the people uh, like the first panelist uh, and so many others today um, are building bigger reserves of the capacity to make this change, to build more collective um, efficacy. Uh, even this conference itself, uh, to me, is representative of a, of a growing community of people, uh, many of whom are, are working within the you know, proverbial belly of the beast as they listen to this conversation right now. And in that sense, uh, hearing from people who are organizers, hearing from people who are activists, hearing from people who are who are struggling with school boards, as as the case of Rebecca Schuster, um, I think that's a really powerful indicator uh, that we have uh, more of us working together than we do of them working against us. Uh, the power is still uneven. The fight is real. Uh, but if we're in the heart of the fight right now, that's probably a good thing because that means, you know, as they say in, in, in church, um, if you're in a storm, you'll soon be coming out of one. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And I think um, the reminder of what we've seen certainly is about um, being in community. Yeah, as you've mentioned with like-minded scholars, practitioners, leaders, I agree. I think one of the most powerful things for me every year about Truth for Transformation is um, the cross-sector, cross-perspective, cross-geography of these conversations, all centered around an analysis of how racial inequity is functioning and what are some of the ways that people are, are pushing the needle, pushing forward change. Samantha Tweedy uh, said something, a great metaphor earlier today about board governance and um, the board being like, you know, the member of your family, like the elder in your family who always has the last word. And they also have an influence on the family. There's the things they, they say and talk about, and the things they don't talk about, but they still are embedded in the family culture. And again, the metaphor being to the organizational culture they trickle down into the organization um, and they also trickle down into who is both represented and also um, who has power. Um, and also she and others you know, have challenged us today to think about the, the real distinction between representation and power. That, that's something that, that really reverberated for me. Um, in terms of this question of, you know, many folks today are going to return back to these families, of or whether or not they feel that way about their colleagues, they're going to return to their organizations. And I'm sure, you know, people are, are walking away with, with lots of different thoughts, but one that we've heard a lot in the chat is, you know, what should I do now? Like, what happens next? What happens, you know, Monday morning? Um, and as we know, there's a lot of value to the pause and not rushing to action as a lot of white people, including myself, have done in our professional careers. And also being really thoughtful about how to work um, collectively. So I'm curious, you know, what you're thinking about that the, some of the take home, you know, can be for people heading into the weekend and into Monday, you know, what are the kind of directions um, that, that we should be thinking about? And, and heading heading in or towards? Well, I think that uh, uh, we have people at all levels of institutional responsibility. Uh, so the extent to which we have executive leader C-suite types who are reporting in to boards, uh, these are folks who have real choices to make. Um, and that is to say, are they gonna lean into um, reality or are they gonna stick with the little island of make-believe? and are they going to recognize that within their own institutional settings, now is an opportunity to do a little bit of truth telling uh, about how they came to be organizations that needed to make racial solidarity statements in the first place? Um, if you recall, Erica, when, <laughs> when all this was happening a year ago, we had a meeting, uh, Ira, about whether we needed to issue a statement. And we decided we didn't need to issue a statement because it's what we already stand for. 
But if people a year ago, if you're a leader and you had to issue a racial solidarity statement because your communications officer said it's the right thing to do at this time, or your BIPOC employees put, put pressure on the company to say, you know, where are we in this moment? Uh, then it's time to figure out, have you been managing a crisis or been leading transformation? Mm. And I think that's a big deal. Mm. And I think the degree to which the family is on board suggests whether or not your leadership uh, needs to move elsewhere. Um, if you have the, uh, the credentials to lead another organization in your sector, uh, th these are the kinds of, I think, big moves that this moment demands. Uh, you know, I think of excellence not by uh, the prestige of an organization, uh, but by the leadership expressed by the individuals who are part of those organizations. You know, there, there are pen plenty of organizations that just assume by association that all their people are excellent. But I tell people all the time, Harvard University, despite what it thinks about having the most excellent people in all pockets of the university, it's just simply not true. Because there are many people I know in my field and in others who are most excellent but would not work at Harvard University because its values don't align with theirs. Its practices and commitments to a lot of the kind of racial equity and anti-racist work that we're talking about is not well represented at the university, is in, uh, in the kind of infant stage uh, in many ways, not, not in total, but certainly in many ways that would surprise people. And there are other places where these muscles uh, are more developed so that's the kind of thing I would say to the C-suite folks. The folks in middle management ha maybe have an easier time of decision making. It's a, you know, the, it's a big market out there, and you know, aligning one's values to organizations and taking advantage of one's mobility to walk in the door and to set new terms for organizations that see themselves uh, interested in change but not sure how to get there. Uh, I think means this is a, a real buyer's market, or I should say seller's market. Um, you can help organizations that say they really want to change and, and test their commitment to that, uh, but, but also by naming some of the key elements of that change up front. Uh, this might seem too pedantic for a conversation like this, but you ask me about practicalities, and I'd say, you know, your bargaining power is uh, strongest as you come in the door. So for those of you thinking about making moves to do uh, more mission alignment with your professional commitments, um, make sure that you, you lay out what the terms are. One of the things we learned last year from my colleague Tamika Curry-Smith, you know, was that when you come in as a, a DEI officer, if you want to be most effective, you need to report to the president, not to the head of HR. Uh, so these, this is sort of one set of, of practical things uh, to think through. I think for folks who are uh, doing uh, stakeholder work, whether that's as community organizers, whether that's as uh, teachers or union leaders or school boards, um, I'm going to take a page out of the People's Institute uh, who participated in our first uh, TNT conference and uh, due to the urgings of Erica made the entire team do an appetizer training session on undoing racism a couple of weeks ago, but you need to have a robust power analysis. Uh, you need to be clear about what are the leverage points uh, for making change. One of the things I said this morning uh, is that so many of the people who came of age after the civil rights movement, black and brown and Asian and Latino first, uh, people who broke barriers to move into institutions of one kind or another, oftentimes found themselves propped up as model minorities uh, who were not there to change the rules, but were there to represent the company. And uh, we heard from the last panel that talked a lot about this, uh, a lot about the limits of representation and the necessity uh, for actually power redistribution. Well, you can't redistribute power if you actually aren't solving for that, if you're just solving for uh, you know, ameliorating inequalities. You know, it's so wonderful that um, Carmen Rojas was with us today because she's representing this work in the philanthropic sector. You know, we don't need more charity, uh, as someone else said in an earlier panel. We need power redistribution. Uh, and so I think, I think that offers people at, at multiple levels of being stakeholders uh, in different institutional settings the capacity to, to, to understand 
to do a power analysis. And if you need to know more about how to do that, go to the People's Institute website to learn more. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we teed that up pretty well. Um, but, you know, in all seriousness, I, I would totally agree that that's what stuck with me so much about the People's Institute's framework when I first came across it was that it was framed as an analysis and that they really had us map out, as you said, what does this look like across every part of our lives? And particularly for, for people harmed and, and uh, directly you know, marginalized in society and, and even killed, you know, what they, they talk about, you know, the, the foot on your neck or the whatever metaphor you wanna use, just how the, the foot of oppression is really kicking, is kicking people and, and what that looks like. Um, I just going back to the the point about statements, you know, I think when we were thinking about this conference, that was very much on our minds, you know, a year later after all these statements, now what? And we even we wrote a piece, I think the original title was a statement on statements. That's right. <laughs> as, That's a direct right. Nod, as a direct nod, you know, to the statements and and, and, the, and the the state of the statements. Um Something that I, I'd love to hear from you about that I don't know if we've touched on directly in the last few minutes is how we've cut across sectors today. So we've heard from people in government, public sector, in nonprofits, in education, in philanthropy, as you just mentioned, in the private sector, and private sector ranging, you know, everything from financial services to, um, you know, food companies. Um, and both what we should be sharing and learning across those sectors, but also how the same racism and the same ways it manifests also runs parallel through all these systems. I think, you know, hopefully people know your own bio and background, but you know, you ran a major institution for a long time. Um, you sit on many boards, um, both, I think you could say public and, and, or nonprofit and private. Um, and you also worked in, in finance as, you know, fresh out of undergrad. <laughs> so you've really seen all these different spaces and also what it means, you know, to be making decisions in these spaces. Um, and just to riff again on something Carmen Rojas and Halima Belgum both talked about is, you know, as you said, people were not in the streets last summer because we want more black coders or more black mm -hmm. CEOs or more black entrepreneurs. It's because black people are being killed daily. So when you think about what that cross-sectoral collaboration looks like to address the very roots of racism and the, the very violence that it's continuing to have and manifest um, across society, you know, what are you thinking about in that regard? Both either what, what folks listening right now should be kind of intentionally doing to to bridge or be in conversation across sectors or, or even just um, learning or, or things that you've seen just having been in so many of these different spaces yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things I can say from my experience on a number of different kinds of nonprofit boards, uh, and particularly in light of last summer, is <laughs> that people are so quick to lose sight of what created the conditions of urgency in the first place. And so when Carmen and Halima talked about reminding us that state violence is a kind of catastrophic injury, it's not a slight, uh, you know, I, I obviously I, I study and I'm an expert on criminal justice history and, and, and you know, this is sort of my sweet spot. And I, I have to constantly remind people that domestic violence is tragic, community violence is tragic, but people are gonna hurt people forever. That's not gonna stop. You know, we, can, we can do a lot of different things to minimize it, most of which we can invest in people at all ages, give them the security that they deserve and the dignity that, uh, that they're entitled to, um, and minimize the likelihood that people will express their frustrations or their sense of power uh, through the physical violation of other people. You don't have to be a philosopher or a political theorist to figure that out. And yet, 
But when the state can kill you in cold blood in front of the world, that's a, an order of magnitude well beyond how human beings uh, can comprehend where they fit in the social order. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were talking about uh, mm -hmm. in the summer of 2020. And yet, uh, in some organizations that I've been involved with, that translated into uh, mentoring programs <laughs> uh, to sort of get more people to be successful in an organization, which whether explicit or implicit it means to get black people to be more like white people, which then is more like when, say, New Jersey state legislators um, in, say, the summer of 2017 and 18, black legislators thought that the solution to police brutality was to teach, by passing a state bill, uh, New Jersey kids how to talk to police officers. You see the pattern, what I'm describing here, that the notion of mentorship as a response to state violence means that the problem is really how people behave in the face of the state um, or how people don't behave in light of an organization whose exclusionary traditions narrow the corridors of recognizable talent and humanity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's a problem. I mean, to me, it demonstrates the depths of understanding of the scope and scale of the problem. It is the natural consequence of uh, the socialization process that Nicole and I talked about uh, during, during her keynote this afternoon, that you know, this notion of the American dream of American exceptionalism um, is so robust and so vigorous and so deeply embedded in the culture of this society that anyone who falls short of this must be evidence of something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. You know, as my former student, that we call this racecraft, a, a form of superstitious belief <laughs> that is so powerful uh, that it can't, it can't accommodate other kinds of realities. This is one of the things that the first panel talked about, which is say when you start challenging people with new information, they can't process it. And Jarek talked a lot about like we need to spend a lot more time on the neuroscience of racism because something's not working, something's not sticking. Uh, and that's what I saw in some organizations. I saw an unwillingness to come to terms with both institutions' own exclusionary traditions. We saw this ourselves at the Harvard Kennedy School when we were trying to change it a few years ago. And we continue to see it in organizations that say, yeah, you know, nothing's wrong with us. Um, we are in solidarity with people, but we're not planning on changing anything. We're just going to set up mentoring programs um, so that people can join our organization uh, and be just like us. So I think the work is, a, is, is challenging, but I think, uh, I, again, I come out of this conference with renewed energy. I, I've come out of it knowing more. Um, I come out of it with a, a bit more humility. Uh, because I recognize that there are people who have really great skills that I will never have, and I'm grateful that they are out in the world doing this work. Uh, and I'm reminded of what, what a great team I have uh, to help pull all this together. So let me thank you, Erica. <laughs> let me thank Miriam and Carrie and Angel and Morgan and Rutna uh, and all the wonderful people at Ash Center. Uh, who supported us, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, for helping uh, to uh, sponsor today's uh, conference. Uh, did I cover it? I think you did. I think, and the musicians, too. Just yes, and the musicians, that's right. Us. That's right. I mean, they had us up. We were all dancing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The creative, the art, you know, that, that, um, that brings, that, that just, you know, gives us the renewed energy to keep doing this work. Right. Breathes life, in, breathes life into us, as Carrie reminded us earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to thank you, Khalil. Um, you have, you just give us that spark every day to really keep having these conversations and, and convene, you know, people both who you've been in deep relationship with, right, which you've mentioned, um, and others that, you know, we're bringing into this collective um, but this day is really a reflection of, of just some amazing relationships that, that you have built as a scholar, as a teacher. So thank you. Well, thank you. 
And uh, with that, I think, are we going to adjourn officially? If I had a gavel, I'd hit it. <laughs> All right. Everyone, we'll see you hopefully next year and keep the conversation going on Twitter, in the, the community forums, which will stay open at least for a bit. Um, and uh, don't be a stranger. The, the community continues. That's right. Take our calls and answer our emails if we reach out to you too. <laughs> <laughs> That's <right. laughs> Bye, everyone.